our scripture lessons this morning. Uh, the first comes from Proverbs chapter 9, 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without scent, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. The second lesson comes from the Gospel of John, continues in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. Listen for the word of God. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Here ends the reading. Friends, would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, God is good. God is good. God is good. This text is confusing. I was waiting for that. Thank you. The, first. the Gospel of John is often understood metaphorically. I think that is probably our best understanding for it, but I can't help but come by this text and go, so are you asking us to be cannibals? or maybe vampires. There's a lot of vampire literature out there and shows and movies. That's a, that's a big kind of cadre of stuff. Cadre is not the right word, but okay. And how do you then take this and make sense of what it says? Maybe faith isn't something we make sense of, but I think this is one of those texts that invites us to really think about it. The thing that captured me about the Proverbs text was the invitation, the language is lay aside immaturity and embrace insight. And it really had me asking, so what is the insight that leads to maturity? How does that happen in community? And I think among other things that is going on in the Gospel of John is that that community is in a bit of an uproar. This is a community of people that used to have a spiritual home, used to have a place where they knew where they went, had a place where they taught, where they knew those they had worshipped with forever. And the community of John gets kicked out of the synagogue. And they're kicked out uh, because they're following this Jesus guy. And so some of the conversation that Jesus has with them today is in direct opposition from where they came. 
Flesh and blood are what make up human life. Jesus is talking about how he can be a part of enabling their lives to be full and abundant. That would have been so important to that community that was adrift at that time. But here's another thing that I thought was so interesting that lives in tension with the fact that the Torah explicitly forbids any flesh with blood left in it to be eaten or any blood to be consumed. So you've got these two things. One that talks about how Jesus gives life, how Jesus nourishes, and this other piece that is opposed to the place from which they came. And it seems to me like that would naturally live in a community of people who'd been expelled from their place of worship, from their place where they were coming closer to God. And now they're faced with this person. So you've got, you've got two communities. You've got one community that's saying, that Jesus guy, yeah, he seems to know Torah, but we don't think he's Messiah. He's Messiah. And you've got the community that is John who says, no, we really think that he is. So when this, when this says the Jews disputed among themselves, those Jews are not all of them. Those are the Jews that have been expelled from the synagogue. And still among themselves are trying to figure out, how does this work? And I think ultimately the question they have to come to ask is, what does life look like? That flesh and blood that make up human life, what Jesus is offering to give them, what does that life look like? embodied in us. How do we live the abundant life that God gives us? Oh, am I supposed to have an answer for that? I am up here. But the truth is, I believe the real challenge of faith is how do we then embody and think about these Questions. So I began to think about community, and I'd be curious as to what you all were thinking about too. I began to wonder, what does it mean to think about the world, that table, the sacrament of our very living is not just the ritual practices of the gathered community when we gather to sing, to worship, to take communion. But what does it mean when the practices of our lives, both as a community and as individuals, are lived out in the world? How are we setting the table for others in all the tables at which we sit? Because what I think is so interesting about that is that Jesus' great invitation in this text is to enter into a deeper relationship with him. So how do we enter into that deeper relationship and then how does that live out of us? What's that look like for a church to do that? What's that look like for an individual to do that? Because what Jesus also says in this text is that he has tied his fate to ours no matter what. Jesus says, I will give you all that I am, and I will tie my fate to yours, no matter what. Now, in communal eating, how many of you have ever eaten at a table? How many of you have ever eaten off the floor? How many of you have ever eaten at the coffee table? Think about all the tables. How many of you have ever eaten at a table with family that was tense? Okay, that may have been the most hands I've seen all morning. Communal eating in the community of John was one of the most important things they did. So when this question about what we eat and what we drink comes up, it is a big deal for them to talk about. It was a mark for them of being the church to sit together and eat together. It was a sign of communal intimacy that we know one another. And how important would that have been to this group of people that were thrown out of a place where they knew everybody well? But if you've ever sat at a table 
where the conversation has gotten tense, you also know that that deep communal intimacy can also come with a potential for offense or difficulty, or you fill in the words. So how does Jesus nourish us to come to table in the midst of those tense conversations and continue to be in relationship with one another? I think being thrown out of your community and being cut off from everything you ever had sets up things that are not going to be useful. Now, this community may have not had much control over that, but I think the challenge for us as the church today is, friends, I don't know if you've noticed, but I have. I feel like we live in a world that is cut off. There are lots of places we can't talk. There are lots of ways we talk about it. Cancel culture. That's a toxic relationship. We have all sorts of reasons for ending them. I think the challenge of the gospel is what does it mean to try to sit with those tense conversations, have a way to talk with one another in the midst of difference, and still be able to say, you know, I'm, I'm clear about what I think. And it may not be the same as what you're, you think but I'm curious to hear about what you're thinking. Is this kind of communing, community, communion, is that the opportunity to gain insight that leads to maturity? Is the community in which we all live, is part of being church, that opportunity to gain insight to lead to maturity? How do we do that? How do we do that at our dinner tables, at our family tables, at our church meeting tables, at our tables over in Fellowship Hall? And how do we invite others to the journey with us to know the living God who invites us to deeper relationship with him or her or them? One of the most profound tables I ever got to observe was one where a group of youth were sitting talking. They were talking about things that had happened and challenges they'd experienced. And at one point, one of them said, you know, my older sister just left for college. And now, all my parents want to do is talk to me. <laughs> the kids sitting next to them looked and said, welcome to my life. They were an only child. But what happened amidst this group of young people was they began talking to one another about what it looked like to be teenagers and how you live into that and what it looked like with their parents. And it wasn't an opportunity to say, here's why all our parents suck. I'm pretty sure I was the subject of some of those conversations in my own children's lives. But what I observed was this was an opportunity for them to talk about how things were different, how things were the same, and how they could connect to and support one another as they tried to make that journey through adolescence and move to a new place. I wonder if that isn't what we are called to do on the journey at all times. Whether we are looking at what it means to be present to those who are coming to our food pantry, or we are talking about what it might mean to have to replace air conditioners. How is it that we are open to God's presence in each and every one of these places? Because friends, I have no doubt that God is in fact present at each and every one of those places. So friends, what questions are you asking? How are you thinking about all this? What's stirred in you as you encounter these two texts? I told you what jumped out at me, but maybe different things jumped out at you. But I think much as Jesus talks about us as abiding in him, that we might abide in God, we are called to inhabit the scripture and let that scripture inhabit us. So in the company of today's text, I pray you will know God's presence 
both in the act of listening for the questions, wondering about the answers, and remembering always to be gentle with yourself and with others as we live through these days. Amen.